Hello and, and good day, everyone. My name is Byron Cheatham, and I'm Senior Vice President with Site of Eva. And today I'm joined by my colleague, Leslie Krauss, um, who's Senior uh, Service and, and Analysis Coordinator at Site of Eva. Uh, and today we're going to share with you uh, some details regarding Site of Eva's hyperspectral uh, microscope capability uh, and focus on the ability to optically observe and spectrally characterize and map a wide range of nanomaterials uh, in tissue samples. Uh, as we know, um, there's a lot of work in, in toxicology as well as in drug delivery and related initiatives uh, where research groups are, ex are either exposing uh, drug uh, delivery mechanisms uh, to animals and eventually humans and or uh, where they're measuring uh, nanoparticle exposure to humans and animals. Uh, this is a technique that we're going to show you today that can be used to help observe the localization of these nanomaterials in a wide range of, of tissue environments. So we thank you for joining us. And after, the, uh, after this webinar, if you have questions and, and would like more information, please feel free to contact us. Um, just a few minutes, uh, a few details about the webinar this morning. Uh, it'll last for approximately 25 minutes. So we've muted calls during the webinar, um, and we'll accept questions after the webinar uh, at info at cytobiva.com. And we'll also have a recorded version of the webinar. Uh, you, you saw we started the recording, so that you can receive a link to this to review it in more detail later and or to share with colleagues, uh, if appropriate. Um, Let's start uh, by just at a very high level uh, providing you some insight on the technology, and then we're going to transition to actually show some live hyperspectral images of nanoparticles in tissue to illustrate uh, how that looks and, and how it works. Um, at Site of Eva, there are two uh, unique technologies that have been integrated together to provide the ability to observe nanomaterials in a wide range of environments with today's focus on uh, tissue. Uh, first is uh, an enhanced uh, dark field optical microscope, patented dark field optics that fit onto a standard research grade optical microscope, which creates very high signal to noise optical images uh, where you have scatter from the sample against the dark background uh, to allow you to observe nanomaterials and these nanomaterials in a wide range of environments such as tissue very quickly very easily without any sample preparation that, uh, that's required. No fluorescent labeling that you would use with any fluorescent technique, uh, whether it's super resolution, confocal, or standard epifluorescence, and no preparation that's required for uh, electron microscopy. So it's very simple from that perspective. Plus, every pixel of a hyperspectral image allows you to query the spectral response in that pixel spatial area. So if I can see nanomaterials in tissue and I can confirm their spectrum in the tissue in relation to the tissue itself, I have a very powerful tool for quickly and accurately confirming the presence and location of nanomaterials, in this case, in tissue. So with that, we're going to transition very quickly um, to show you some actual examples of, of, of nanomaterials that are in tissue. And uh, because it's difficult sometimes to, to conduct image analysis and, uh, and, and talk, uh, Leslie is going to uh, run the system here while I try to describe the samples that we're looking at. And the first sample uh, that Leslie uh, is, is going to focus on are um, silica uh, materials that uh, are in lung tissue, mouse lung tissue. And these are silica particles where uh, the mouse actually inhaled uh, the, the particulate, and uh, then the lung tissue uh, was removed ex vivo, sliced, put on a microscope slide, and, and deparathenized. Unstained tissue with no sample prep whatsoever, straight from uh, the mouse lung. And so you see where the cursor is that Leslie has right now a crosshair on this zoom image, and this is a hyperspectral image, and the crosshair is on an actual silica particle that's in the tissue. And if you look at the spectral response on the right, you see the spectral response of that pixel's spatial area. Now, as Leslie moves off of that 
that, uh, that silica particle onto another silica particle, you see that the spectrum is very similar, but there was a slight change. And then as she moves on to a third silica particle, you see a change in the spectrum again slightly, but still a general characteristic of that. Now as Leslie moves on to a third, you see a pretty dramatic, or fourth, you see a pretty dramatic shift in the spectrum. One of the things that this technique uh, allows you to do is to understand how the material, uh, in this case, the silica particles, as they interact with tissue, the tissue has a way of changing the spectral response. So as Leslie just clicked onto an area of tissue that contains no nanoparticles, you see a dramatic change in the spectrum. And now she's going to collect two different spectrum so that you can see a comparison. So she's collecting spectrum of tissue, and now she's collected spectrum of the silica particle. And this allows you to very easily see the dramatic difference. Silica in its reflectivity in the microscope is dramatically more uh, bright and intense than the tissue itself, especially in this case lung tissue, which is uh, very porous, and this is probably about a five micron slice. So if I'm able to optically observe and spectrally characterize the silica in the tissue, um, this is a, a, a very rapid process uh, to, to be able to, to uh, understand how these nanomaterials are localizing the tissue, the relative amount of nanoparticles, and where in the tissue they're localizing. Uh, just by, by way of, uh, of, of reference, just th this morning, um, Leslie was working on a project with asbestos fibers in lung tissue. Uh, and you might want to talk a little bit about some of the observations you made with that, Leslie, and, and what we were able to find. Yeah, that's right. Fibers are a little bit different than these uh, generally circular nanomaterials. They actually embed in the tissue. And you can actually see them on different focal planes. And we have a couple of different algorithms for evaluating uh, nanomaterials in the tissue, one of which is you would collect reference spectra, very similar to the red spectra that you see in the spectral profile. And then you can map spectral profiles directly. Another one is peak location classifier, where you can actually use reference peaks and intensities to um, evaluate where the nanomaterials are. Those intensities also allow you to look at the depth, because as the material becomes more deeply embedded in the tissue, it's less able to scatter light. Very good. Thanks, Leslie. Now, now Leslie's going to move on, and we're actually going to close out the hyperspectral image file of the, um, of the lung tissue with the silica, and we're going to look at lymph node tissue now. And lymph node, this is lymph node tissue where gold nanoparticles were targeted to the lymph node tissue as part of a drug delivery application. And so Leslie now has, uh, is selecting uh, individual uh, pixels of spectrum of the lymph node tissue that contains uh, the gold nanoparticles. And you see the small green area. Gold, as it, uh, as it aggregates, will redshift. So as Leslie's uh, clicking on pixels to illustrate uh, the, uh, the, the smaller uh, areas of less aggregation, you see the, a wavelength at about 575 nanometers. But as she clicks on a clear aggregate of the gold in the tissue, you see two things that occur. There's a red shift in the peak of, of, the, uh, of the material itself. And of course, there is more intensity of scatter in an aggregated area of gold as opposed to a more dispersed area of gold. And now, as she, like she did earlier with the silica particles, goes off into an area where there is no gold uh, that appears to be visibly uh, present you see a dramatically different spectral curve there in the tissue only. And of course, just as we saw with the silica nanoparticles, the, uh, the tissue spectrum um, uh, is, is much reduced in its intensity. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So we wanted to show you those examples before we actually provided you some details regarding the, uh, the actual instrument and how it's uh, configured to produce this type of result, and then show some more examples. So with that, we will, uh, we will take you through some details regarding the instrument. And first, you've already seen this to some degree.
But there are really four things that you can expect to do with Cytoviva's enhanced dark field and, and hyperspectral uh, microscope uh, capability. The first thing is you can observe nanomaterials, as we mentioned earlier, without any labels or sample prep. However, if they are labeled, you can also see that and, and you can measure the spectrum of a labeled nanoparticle. You can observe these nanomaterials as they interact with labeled or unlabeled biologicals. You see here on the right a multi-wall carbon nanotube, and this time it's actually in a stained lung tissue. You see the spectral response of the multi-wall carbon nanotube as opposed to the spectral response of the stained tissue. And then finally, if you can spectrally identify and characterize these nanomaterials, you can conduct all sorts of detailed analysis with the hyperspectral image analysis software, such as spectrally mapping these materials in the biologicals. And we're going to show some examples of that here in a second. Uh, very quickly, we want to give you just a, a, a brief overview of the footprint of the system. And, and you see at the core is a standard research-grade optical microscope. Uh, Cytoviva's patented dark field illumination optic fit in the condenser mount of the microscope and replaced the standard condenser that you would use on the microscope. And it's the condensing uh, of the light that provides this enhanced dark field, very high signal-to-noise image. You see the spectrograph with an integrated detector. We'll talk some more about that in the, in the uh, seat mount or camera mount of the microscope. And you see an automated stage that's used to push the sample across the field of view of the microscope optics and the spectrograph and camera to build this hyperspectral image file, pixel row by pixel row, that, uh, that we observed earlier. Typically, samples such as the one Leslie was showing you take, uh, those samples were probably, what, Leslie, about uh, two to three minutes to capture those images? Yeah, two to three minutes. Okay, mm -hmm. awesome. So um, one other important point is, is that we typically always use uh, standard uh, halogen uh, full-spectrum illumination to capture these images. And that's really relevant for two reasons. One is, is that we create the image in the microscope with a standard halogen lamp so that you can observe the full spectrum image. And if I can capture a hyperspectral image with that as well, in that case, the spectral data and the optical image look the same. Because if you were to look in the eyepiece of the microscope as those silica particles with the lung tissue was on the microscope, they would look in the microscope almost exactly like that hyperspectral image looks. So you get, um, Leslie and I often talk about it, you get the full spatial context of the spectral data. Uh, and that's so very valuable and so complementary to other techniques such as Raman, which uh, creates sort of a pseudo image and gives you a quantitative data. Or um, if, you're, if you're using, uh, for example, um, ITP mass spec, which gives you great quantitative spectral data, but it's destructive to the sample, and you really can't understand the interrelationship between nanomaterials and tissue in this example. So uh, just a little bit of, of time on the enhanced dark field optics, and I want to talk about this. I was, I was working yesterday with um, an actual uh, user at ETH in Zurich, Switzerland, who just completed her PhD work, and she said these dark field optics looking at nanoparticle and nanoparticle interaction uh, with uh, different functional groups, allowed her to complete her PhD work about a year quicker than otherwise, using standard dark field optics because of the increased signal to noise. And so you see with uh, dark field illumination, light comes from a condensing system at an oblique or sideways angle, such that it interacts with the sample and scatter from the sample goes into the ejective against the dark background. In any image here, you see the polystyrene beads and the scatter from those beads against the dark background. However, with standard dark field optics, uh, with microscope companies uh, such as Olympus or Zeiss or Daikon, they use a very inefficient process and have forever in terms of managing the light from the source illumination through the base of the microscope to the condenser system. You see it, it, go, it travels quite a ways uh, through field lenses and collector lenses, which are typically not high quality, and travels as much as nine centimeters through the air from the field diaphragm up to the condenser. So most of the light is lost, and the light cannot be efficiently focused in this technique. And as a result, it produces uh, an ineffective dark field image in most cases. 
And so Cytadeva and the uh, developers of the Cytadeva technology at Auburn University in the U.S. were able to solve that problem and improve the light efficiency and improve the ability to focus dark field in a very dramatic way through the development of this dark field illumination system that we see here in the image. And without going into the physics, but just describing a little bit about uh, the, the technique, they took the source illumination, and instead of sending it through the microscope and sending it through nine centimeters of air, they connected the source illumination via liquid light guide to the dark field illumination system. And then they used collimating lenses and mirrors to precisely focus that source illumination onto the very high numerical aperture dark field condenser so that they can maximize the number of oblique angle photons that can be focused on a very shallow focal plane, the focal plane where your sample and tissue are. And this is the result. And if you look at the image on the left, you see those 240 nanometer polystyrene beads with a standard dark field microscope as opposed to one with a side of EVA enhanced dark field microscope. Approximately a 7x increase in signal to noise has been measured by multiple independent parties with this technique. And the researcher at ETH in Zurich that I was visiting with yesterday said that uh, it was this difference that allowed uh, the rapid uh, improvement in their research looking at functional groups added to gold nanoparticles. So with the technique, what you can expect from a detection perspective, scatter detection of materials, is the ability to detect noble metals, metal oxide, silica nanoparticles down to about 10 to 15 nanometers, and soft nanomaterials such as liposomes down to about 50 to 75 nanometers. And then finally, um, if you look here at this image, this shows from a hyperspectral imaging perspective what really high quality dark field optics do in terms of the integrity of the spectral data. Because as everyone knows that, that's ever spent any time with spectroscopy, good spectroscopy is, is all about good signal to noise. So the image on the right was captured using the site of EVA uh, enhanced dark field uh, microscope, and the hyperspectral image was captured. You see the single pixel spectra, which Leslie illustrated earlier for you here, and the spectral intensity and, the, uh, and the, the good signal to noise ratio that's observed, as opposed to using the standard dark field optics and measuring the exact same pixel of the exact same nanoparticle and using the exact same settings in the hyperspectral imagery. You see a dramatic reduction in the intensity and you see lots of noise in the signal. So very quickly, we want to make sure so many people in, in, in biosciences or nanobio really don't understand hyperspectral imaging, and, and that, that makes sense because its origins were more geospatial and aerial oriented. But hyperspectral imaging involves taking a vis near infrared or shortwave infrared diffraction grading spectrograph and integrating a camera, either a, a CCD or an EMCCD, or in the case of the shortwave infrared, an N gas detector onto the spectrograph. So I can capture spectral images. Um, and uh, by putting that on the microscope and by having an automated stage on the microscope, that will push the sample across the field of view of the spectrograph, which contains a 30 micron slit at the, at the base of the microscope to allow light onto the diffraction grating and the camera. You're able to uh, capture those spectral images that Leslie illustrated for you pixel row by pixel row. As we, say, as we see here. So that spectra data can be gathered. And in the examples that Leslie provided you, uh, it was done in, in minutes. Um, so that we can capture in the biz near infrared all of the spectrum in every pixel from 400 to 1,000 nanometers uh, and in the swirl from 900 to 1,700. And the data, as you saw in the, in, in, that we showed earlier, you get a full RGB image, a red, green, blue image and the spectra is queried in every pixel at very high spectral resolution so that detailed quantitative analysis can be, um, can be illustrated. And so now with that, um, we're going to um, actually show some examples of the type of analysis that can be conducted with this as, as we close the webinar for the morning. And this is the example uh, that Leslie showed you earlier. And I'd like for her to maybe describe what we're seeing in these two images 
uh, very quickly and as we go through the mapping that was done in the next samples. All right, as you can see in the image on the top, that's the same image that we clicked through earlier this morning, that the exposed the lung tissue that had been exposed to silicon nanoparticles. The tissue on the bottom is a controlled tissue. This was a mouse that had not been exposed to the silica and sacrificed, but had been sacrificed the same way. Um, so in this case, what we would ideally like to do is find spectra that is consistent with silicon nanoparticles in the tissue and use the negative control to remove any false positives that we might have um, detected from our original data gathering, and then use that spectral library we created and map it on there. Um, one observation before we go is you can sort of tell a difference in the quality of the tissue itself. The tissue itself in the upper image shows damage from the silica that had been inhaled, whereas the tissue in the bottom has a much, much healthier look. So in the next slide, you'll see on the right a spectral library that was created. Um, you can, there are several different algorithms <laughs> that help you create good, valid spectral data. Um, okay, so <laughs> we actually use the mapping algorithm and so that every spectral curve in that spectral library is compared to every pixel in this image, and every pixel that matches within 10% um, statistic validity is pseudo-colored red. And on that bottom graph, you can see that you actually have semi-quantitative data showing you how many pixels in that image actually matched with um, the spectra in the spectral library. Now, once you have created good, valid spectral data, you can use it across every unknown sample in your um, experimental set. Very good. Thanks, Leslie. And then the, the last uh, piece of data that we want to show you is, is that we captured a mean spectra of the silica in tissue that's represented by the green curve and normalized it to an intensity factor of one and are demonstrating that against the mean spectra of a large number of pixels of the control tissue that uh, Leslie showed you earlier, and normalized it to one. And this is a, a very dramatic way to illustrate the spectral response difference between the control tissue and the silica in tissue. It's very compelling data to, to illustrate uh, the presence of the silica in the tissue. Um, the next sample set that we want to take you through, just to show uh, materials that were used for a drug delivery application, and this is a very complex uh, sample set. In this case, uh, uh, medical drug-grade uh, nanotubes, carbon nanotubes, were loaded with a chemotherapy, were injected into the mouse, and those uh, nanotubes with chemotherapy localized in very specific areas of tissue. And so you see here the hyperspectral image of the tissue uh, that had been exposed to the nanotubes of the chemotherapy. The spectral library that you see on, on, the, uh, on the right is a spectral library uh, that's consistent with the nanotubes and the chemotherapy. Now, one of the things that you often have to do, we mentioned that you use a halogen lamp to, uh, to capture these full spectrum images. To do hyperspectral imaging, sometimes you will need to normalize against the lamp spectrum to remove the effects of the lamp from the spectrum. There's an algorithm and software that allows for that to create very high integrity uh, spectral libraries, as you see here. Now, in the image here, we're looking at where we mapped two different, uh, two different uh, spectral libraries. I only showed you one, but I want to show you again the power of the tool, um, because there are two different uh, things that we observed in this tissue. The first thing that we observed in the tissue was the presence of carbon nanotubes without the chemotherapy influence spectrally. And I mention that to say that if I take any nanomaterial and I functionalize it with additional chemistry, in this case the chemistry that I functionalized it with was the chemo, I change that nanomaterial's spectral response. Okay? And so here we actually 
created two spectral libraries, one of carbon nanotubes only and one of the carbon nanotubes with the chemo. And the chemo spectra is the predominant spectrum when it's added to the nanotubes. And so what you're able to see here are areas in the tissue where there's carbon nanotube only spectrum and where there's chemotherapy carbon nanotube spectrum. And a, a very interesting occurrence was noted here is that in many areas where the carbon nanotubes had localized in areas of the tissue, the chemo had been released. And as a result of that, we see the chemotherapy carbon nanotube spectra, which is represented in the red, uh, form in areas around the, the carbon nanotube only spectrum, such that this research group was able to prove using this technique that carbon nanotubes with chemotherapy localized in very specific areas of the tissue and the chemotherapy was there and was being released from the carbon nanotubes. So this is a very significant uh, data set uh, from uh, these samples and is very helpful in pharmacokinetic studies related to nanodrug delivery and, and related applications. Um, what we want to show here is the spectral library of the nanotubes alone and the nanotubes with chemotherapy. And you can see that nanotubes alone produce a distinctly different spectral response when they're normalized as opposed to nanotubes with chemotherapy. You see how dramatically different the chemotherapy affects the nanotube spectrum. And now you can see why we were able to map the chemotherapy in the tissue with such a high degree of confidence. So those are the examples that we wanted to show you this morning. But in closing, hopefully we've given you some insight as to how enhanced dark field hyperspectral microscopy can allow you to very quickly optically observe nanomaterials without any labels or special sample prep. And more importantly, observe those nanomaterials as they're interacting with labeled or unlabeled biologicals very quickly and very easily. And then we can spectrally identify nanomaterials, and as you saw in the last example, even drug associated with nanomaterials in these tissues. And as a result of that, using the hyperspectral image analysis software that was designed specifically for these applications, we can spectrally map nanomaterials and their functional groups in these biologicals, and we can do mean spectra comparisons between tissue and nanomaterials to help you in your research be able to demonstrate and illustrate the presence and location of nanomaterials in tissue very quickly and very easily. Now, I might add, too, that it also works with mammalian cell culture. You can imagine if it works with tissue, it works very well with mammalian cell culture. And also, this technique is used to identify nanomaterials in a wide range of other matrices that aren't biological. And finally, the ability to observe um, biological specimens in other biological environments, such as tissue, is, is very possible. And that last example, uh, and I could, we could provide it to anyone who's interested, is where there's a group uh, that has used this technique to identify amyloid proteins uh, in brain tissue and retinal tissue. Uh, and that was a very intensive project to be able to demonstrate and illustrate that. But it proves the sensitivity of the capability. If I can find an amyloid protein in tissue, finding uh, a nanoparticle that's used as a drug delivery vector or finding a nanoparticle uh, that has been inhaled in, in uh, a toxicology study uh, is really feasible. So with that, we're going to close uh, uh, this today, uh, and we would invite you to contact us. The, the easiest way is to send us an, uh, an email at info at siteofiva.com. You can call us if you would like. Uh, you can find the number on our website, and we would be more than pleased to uh, provide any additional data to you about the technique. And if you would like to test the samples, you can send samples to our imaging lab here at Site of Eva in the U.S., or if appropriate, we and our, our distribution partners around the world can come to your lab to conduct a demonstration and show you how this works hands-on with your sample, and we'd be pleased to do that for you. So thank you for your time and attention this, uh, this, this, this day, and we hope to, uh, to visit with you soon. Thank you.